I sometimes walk down White Ladies Road and I, and I think to myself, how the hell did you pull this off? I always wanted to be in television and when I left university, somebody was looking for a researcher and it just one of those lucky things. I was just there at the right time and got in there. And as I say, I started doing a bit of science, a bit of children's, a bit of social documentary. And then I met Peter Jones, who was an executive producer down here, and he was starting up The Trials of Life. And I thought I'd do it for three years. I thought I'd spend three years doing a natural history film, working with David Attenborough, of course, which was fantastic. And then I'd go back to doing social documentaries, all that type of thing. Yeah, once I've done that, why would you do anything else? Best job in the world. What led me into video was the fact that Canon came out with a camera that had a little button, and you could turn it this way and it said video. <laughs> One of my clients, Greenland Tourism, have sent me to Greenland several times before to do still pictures. And this specific time, they were going to send me up again. Um, but they were going to send me together with the film crew. And um, I convinced them that I could do the job. So they shouldn't send the video crew, they should just send me and I'll get an extra assistant to carry a little bit more gear. The whole thing about composition and light and movement and people and telling stories, it's already, it was already there in my blood, really. I just had to figure out what to film before and what to film after. I'm used to finding the moment, just had to find a little bit before and a little bit after. I didn't find it difficult, uh, maybe because I didn't know how difficult it was, it didn't scare me off, so I just dove into it uh, head first, and it was a success. Every wildlife assignment has its challenges, there's never an easy one. The trickiest one was probably the, one of the very first ones, because I was a newbie, and that was going to the forest of Madagascar filming a creature called a bamboo lemur. This particular forest in Madagascar was incredibly steep sided. It's this kind of limestone, so it's very steep hills, very, very thick forest, and goes right down, then goes right back up again. And of course, these little bamboo lemurs lived in the treetops, and they would just be sitting in the treetops. We'd just get the camera ready, and they would just jump about three, two or 300 meters, and they'd be on the other side of the valley. So we then had to run all the way down this valley, all the way back up again, which would be about the equivalent of about half a kilometer, get our cameras in position, just a bit, and they'd think, hmm, actually, I prefer that tree back over there, and hop back over there. And I swear they were doing it deliberately. And this was days and days and days. And then in the end again, just like it often happens, the little thing decided, actually, I'm just going to sit here quietly, peel my little bits of bamboo and eat this bamboo. And it did it for about 10 minutes. Got all the shots in that 10 minutes for the whole sequence in 10 minutes. We came away. Of course, then you forget all the horrible bits because you've got the sequence. Thick, tough, central African rainforest is a tough, tough place. Everything wants to eat you, the humidity is horrendous, it's tough. Photographing in extreme cold, that's difficult. The pain of the cold just sucks all your creativity and all your concentration out of you, so it's just, just to focus on your idea is almost impossible. Um, it's uh, hard on the gear, your batteries last like about 10% of the time, I don't know, but they don't last very long. One time I remember I had, uh, I had these, I've got these big mittens on, you know, I've got uh, woolen gloves on them and then I've got these other mittens on underneath uh, and then I've got a big one on here. So to work, I have to take a couple of these layers off and underneath I've got wool gloves. But unfortunately, um, my wool gloves had a little hole in it. I was opening my tripod up, but this piece of skin on my, on my bare finger touched the tripod and stuck to the tripod. And um, so I'm out there, and I didn't want to rip my finger off because uh, the skin would stay on my tripod, so I had to do something. But luckily, we had a lot of warm tea. But unluckily, we drank all the tea. But luckily, you know what happens when you drink a lot of tea and you're cold? Yeah, so I can leave the rest up to your imagination. One of the things that is our kind of signature, if you like, from the Natural History Unit is that we've always been at the cutting edge, the forefront of technology, trying to find different ways of revealing the wonders of nature to the audience. Sometimes what happens is we have a piece of behavior and then we think, how can we show that? Let's, let's kind of design some technology. More often, I would say, the opposite happens. Some technology kind of emerges from in, on the, in the world, in the, in the market, and we're very good at hacking this technology. So we're good, very good at saying, aha, that piece of knowledge, now if we modify that, and did this, then actually that could reveal a piece of behavior that we've always wanted to show, but we've never been able to. And that was, was particularly the case, I think, of nighttime, because you know, so much of what happens in the natural world does happen at night. One of the stories that I love is a story about uh, black rhinos, which we did for Africa. People think that rhinos, they have a sort of, almost a cliche idea of rhinos. They're solitary, they're grumpy, aggressive. You're not an animal you'd ever want to kind of bump into at night. Under the cover of darkness, rhinos actually came together and they got frisky and they got amorous and they effectively had a party under the stars but you could only see it by staking it out using these starlight 
and infrared cameras. That sequence, I think, was personally, I thought, was a real groundbreaker because it used that technology in a fantastic way, but also it completely changed our view of one of the most famous animals on the, that we know. When people's jaws drop, as they do, because it is a surprise, what people love is surprise. You know, it, it great, the best stories are always have a surprise twist to them, don't they? And so when people get that surprise and you see the, the jaw drop, it's great, you know. That's a, and I love doing that, I love that to happen to me. So if I can let that happen to, make that happen to other people, then that's a big tick. Since I was a kid, I grew up in the country in Australia, and since I was a kid, I've, um, I've experienced this presence. I guess you could call it like a radio station. If you're in the city, it's like, oh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> the channels are changing all the time. When you get outside into the nature, there's only one channel, same channel every day, 24 hours a day. <laughs> and that is what attracts me. I'd much rather be out there working than anywhere inside. This connection uh, with people and nature, I think, is extremely important and uh, I, I, I focus a lot on that connection in my work. I think uh, I try to, through my images, inspire people to want to go out into nature because I think when we get out into nature, we can feel it ourselves. The more people that have a connection with the earth and uh, respect it and love it, the more people won't want to hurt it, won't want to destroy it, and will want to protect it as well.